it's time to dive even deeper into the survival horror. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 facts about the Resident Evil franchise. Okay, let me handle this. For this list, we've scoured the web for the most interesting facts about one of gaming's most iconic franchises, and have selected the ones that we felt were the most intriguing and lesser known among even the most hardcore fans of the series. This is my last... wish. Number 10, Home Sweet Home. <laughs> Based on a Japanese horror film, Sweet Home was a psychological horror RPG tie-in that shadowed a team of documentary filmmakers looking to procure valuable paintings inside an abandoned mansion in the middle of a forest. Little do they know that the residence is actually a haunted abode occupied by countless monsters and ghouls. Does that sound familiar? More features that might ring a bell include puzzle subgames, limited inventory storage, scattered notes as a storytelling mechanic, and oh yeah, a door based loading screen. This is all due to the fact that Resident Evil 1 was originally in development as a Sweet Home remake, so don't be calling out Capcom for plagiarism since both IPs are owned by them. This mansion is gigantic. We could get into trouble if we get lost. Number 9, Jill Sandwich. That was too close. You were almost a Jill Sandwich. <laughs> You're right! Most players agree that if there's one thing the first Resident Evil did poorly, it was its writing. This was so bad that even Capcom is in on the joke now. I was almost a Claire Sandwich. Ugh, does Barry tell everyone that story? When it comes to the particularly extra cheesy Jill Sandwich line, its first reappearance is on an arbitrary recipe note that players can find in the mobile game Resident Evil Uprising. This same line is once again referenced in Capcom's Dead Rising, where in the first floor of the game's shopping mall setting, players can find a decently subtle illusion that only Resident Evil fans will appreciate. That was a close one. A second late, you would have fit nicely into a sandwich. Really? Thanks. Number 8, Dub Trouble. We've established that Resident Evil's dialogue isn't exactly the most clever. Evidently, so did the franchise's creator, Shinji Mikami, who also helmed the first Resident Evil game as its director and producer. Well, I intimidated him, but it had nothing to do with Umbrella. For those of you going, no duh, when we say he thought the dialogue was horrible, he meant the Japanese dialogue of the first game. As a result, Mikami removed the Japanese lines from the game altogether, favoring the new English-speaking actors and dialogue, all of which he felt fit the American setting better anyway. Don't mention it. What a monster! I can't believe... What the hell is this place anyway? To Mikami's credit, those of us who have seen and heard the Japanese cut probably would have made the same decision. However, to his discredit, it probably ran circles around lines like this. It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. Number 7. Evil May Cry. Time to go to work, guys. Taking a painful six years to complete, Resident Evil 4 underwent numerous overhauls prior to its release in 2005. I'm sure you boys didn't just tag along so we could sing Kumbaya together at some Boy Scout bonfire. One proposed concept was a tone down from guns in favor of a more aggressive melee-based combat system. Enter Devil May Cry, or the game that was supposed to be Resident Evil 4. I only take special jobs. Near its completion, the game was ultimately shelved after Shinji Mikami felt that it <laughs> strayed too far from the series' survival horror feel. Freeze! I said freeze! Nevertheless, Capcom refused to drop what was completed of the gorgeously designed game, and so they had to repackage it under a new name and franchise. A similar thing was done with Onimusha, which was originally an oriental-themed version of Resident Evil 1. Destroy all the demons! Number 6, Night of the Living Evil. Did you guys know that at one point, the godfather of the zombie genre himself, George A. Romero, was hired to write and direct a film adaptation of Resident Evil? It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. Well, this was indeed the case in 1998, when Capcom approached him for the project after being impressed with his direction for the 30-second live-action ad of Resident Evil 2. <laughs> Initially, he declined since he didn't want to do more films with zombies in him. Romero ultimately reconsidered. 
However, the screenplay he submitted was reportedly so bad that he was subsequently dropped from the project and replaced with Paul W.S. Anderson. I know what you're thinking, but then again, you ever see Survival of the Dead? <laughs> Number 5. No Fixed Residence Evil Following the unprecedented success of the first game, it was only natural for Capcom to attempt to double down by porting it to other major consoles. One such effort was to attempt to reintroduce the title to handheld gamers via the new and rising Game Boy Color. Dissatisfied with the finished product, the port was ultimately scrapped and unreleased with Capcom's official statement citing a lack of confidence that the product would have held up to gamer standards. Nevertheless, a prototype was eventually leaked in 2012, and despite reports detailing its perfect room-for-room -room and event-for-event -event recapturing, most players ultimately agreed with Capcom's decision, commonly conciding that it just wasn't suitable for the format. Still, it would have been better than Resident Evil Gaiden. Number 4, Resident Evil 3, Code Veronica. Why isn't someone doing something about this? I didn't know you were still alive, Jill. After the underestimated success of Resident Evil 2, Capcom went straight to developing not only the next main installment, but also a spin-off tie-in showcasing the events that led to the T-virus outbreak in Raccoon City. We've got to get out of here. What? What do you think you're talking about? The plan appeared to be rock solid. However, in all their hastiness, Capcom had apparently forgotten the length to which their Sony contracts extended, binding them to release two numbered titles or official sequels exclusively for the PlayStation. Relax, beautiful. I said I was sorry. Hence, the spin-off that was merely Resident Evil Nemesis had a 3 shoved into its title, with Code Veronica, which many Capcom developers still regard as the true Resident Evil 3, was altered as the spin-off. That was too close. But I found something, thanks to you. Number 3, Resident Sequel. After the completion of the initial game that was to be Resident Evil 2, Capcom execs were not impressed, particularly with its dated-looking finish and conclusive ending for the narrative. This forced the franchise's first push of the reset button, making the unreleased version of Resident Evil 2 known to gamers as Resident Evil 1.5. drastically distinct from the original. 1.5 featured a different female protagonist as well as an RPG-esque mechanic for developing characters and weapon stats. Additional changes from the initial draft included major remodeling of characters, delaying the official sequel even further and prompting Capcom to apologize to fans in the form of a playable demo released with a Resident Evil 1 director's cut. Number 2, Guinness World Record Holder. Whoa! What is it? Yeah, we know. Whoa, the franchise has a Guinness World Record? Shocker, right? Jill, you're here too. Yes, you're here too? Well, how about we give you guys a few guesses as to what the records are for? Most gory video game series of all time? Nah. Best horror-based brand of all time? Guess again. Wait, it can't be the best-selling video game franchise of all time, right? No, it's not. Not even close. Please give this photo to my family. The correct answer is, it's the worst game dialogue ever. We've already covered why the dialogue was so bad, but to earn a world record for the worst is still rather impressive as a landmark. I'm sorry for my lack of manners, but I'm not used to escorting men. To be fair, the series holds two other records, the highest grossing game licensed movies and the first live action movie trilogy based on a video game. God damn it, Paul Anderson. You adapted it, changed it. You became magnificent. I became a freak. Before we send chills down your spine with our favorite Resident Evil fact, let's have a look at some honorable mentions. Number one. Resident Evil was conceived as a first-person shooter. Ah, must be my imagination. That's right, fanboys. Believe it or not, this franchise was originally intended to run in the vein of what would have been season four runners like Wolfenstein and Doom. 
despite the FPS genre's fast rise in popularity at the time. Developers at Capcom felt that the technology available didn't allow it to fuse well with the horror genre. As a result, they opted for an approach which mirrored that of the then-action-adventure-based game Alone in the Dark. Though Resident Evil would later re-explore the first-person perspective concept with the rail shooters Umbrella and Darkseid Chronicles, those all flounder in comparison to the brilliant, frightening, ammo-conserving third-person survival horror that we all came to love. I owe you one. Don't mention it. Do you agree with our list? I'm glad and all, but why are you here? Which Resident Evil fact did we miss? For more eye poppin' top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. We are in great danger. We must organize a search for the others and get the hell out of here.